Good morning. The waiting is over in the Gulf. The war has begun. Just two hours ago, Allied Air Forces began an attack on military targets in Iraq and Kuwait. These attacks continue as I speak. Well, the biggest thing I saw was one of the most fantastic fireworks demonstrations I've seen since the uh, Fourth of July party uh, years and years and years ago. This was tremendous. Baghdad was lit up like a Christmas tree. Five months ago, Saddam Hussein started this cruel war against Kuwait. Tonight, the battle has been joined. For the last 14 hours, U.S. fighters and bombers have been pounding the strategic facilities in Iraq and Kuwait, the first phase of an air assault that figures to be unrelenting. The campaign will continue until the whole campaign is completed. It doesn't end. So far, Iraqi resistance has been minimal. But though Saddam Hussein has taken far more than he's given, he's vowing to fight on. Just hours ago, addressing his people, he said, the mother of all battles has started. The great showdown has begun. This is today, Thursday, January the 17th, 1991. From NBC News, this is a special edition of Today, America at War. Now, here are Bryant Gumbel and Deborah Norville. And good morning. Welcome to today and the special edition on a Thursday morning that finds this country at war with Iraq. And I guess we should not find that as a big surprise because the president has been telling us all along that unless and until and if, then this. Yeah. And it uh, came to that. But evidently Saddam Hussein uh, took it as something of a surprise based on the uh, response that uh, early reports say uh, he was able to launch against the Allied right. forces. Yeah, it has it has not gone his way. We're going to bring you up to speed on Operation Desert Storm. It ceased to be Desert Shield when White House spokesman Marlon Fitzwater read a presidential statement announcing that the liberation of Kuwait had begun. That was at 7 p.m. Eastern time, and by then, the first of many missiles and bombs were already striking Baghdad. And while the exact number of planes involved in that first wave has uh, still not been specified, it did involve several hundred sorties and the forces of not only the United States, but also pilots from Great Britain, from Saudi Arabia, and from Kuwait. And if we can agree that shooting qualifies as bad news, the good news on this Thursday morning is that while losses were expected to run very high in the early going, preliminary reports indicate relatively light Iraqi resistance. At this hour, Baghdad Radio is still claiming that Iraqi forces brought down 14 warplanes, but that's a claim that the Pentagon has labeled as ridiculous. The first explosion shook Baghdad in the uh, dawn hours under cover of darkness, and only now are we beginning to get scattered reports of just how much damage was done. We'll be checking in with Tom Aspel in just a little bit. But right now, let's go to Dharan, Saudi Arabia, where NBC News correspondent Mike Betcher is standing by. Mike, what can you tell us about the activity there at this hour? Well, I believe, Brian, we can uh, stop counting the attacks in waves because uh, the attacks seem to be constant. The takeoffs, at least from the area I'm standing in northeast Saudi Arabia, are constant. British jets taking off to the left of me, American F-15s taking off to the right of me. Uh, it's pretty much nonstop throughout the day. Now, we had a report earlier from British military sources that a British tornado jet crashed in the fighting. Uh, the two crewmen are missing. There was a report from the Iranian news agency that an American F-15E had crashed in the Gulf and that the two uh, pilots on board had ejected. I think we can look at that report with a great deal of skepticism at the present time. That same press agency is reporting that every 30 minutes, missiles, Iraqi missiles, are landing in the location where I'm standing now. And believe me, I would know if uh, <laughs> missiles were landing here every 30 minutes. Uh, so this is a very massive strike. Uh, Observers, experts in the field of ordnance are saying that it's one and a half times greater than the attack on Hiroshima, the atom bomb there, and twice as powerful as the massive air raid on Dresden that created the huge firestorm in World War II. So we're looking at, indeed, a very, very um, large area. That's, that's in tonnage. We might, we might qualify that. Mike, Mike, I was watching last night when, when your signal went down and everybody else's too. What was the mood there? We were uh, a little concerned. Uh, I was uh, talking when the air raid uh, siren went off. Uh, I grabbed the gas mask uh, out of my bag, uh, put the canister on it, screwed it on. And uh, Tom asked me, well, what do you hear? And I said, well, I think I hear a jet engine. 
and uh, continued to talk, and all of a sudden the screen went to hash. Uh, people then went downstairs to try to go to the bomb shelter, and then I thought, my wife's watching this, and she's going to think that uh, a missile hit here. So I said uh, to one of our bosses here, uh, Bob McFarlane, I said, I got to go upstairs and get on the phone. So I uh, got on the phone and uh, basically uh, called uh, into nightly news uh, for broadcast, but also to let my wife and my family know that uh, no missile had hit yet. <laughs> That's uh, a good thought. So uh, we thought that, uh, that inbound missiles were coming. Everyone expected a retaliation, yeah. and uh, there was no retaliation, or the missiles couldn't get here, or they crashed. We just don't know yet. I'm sure your wife just loved that story of affection. Mike Betcher, <laughs> <laughs> thanks very much. Let's go, let's go on to the Pentagon right now, in Washington, where our national correspondent, Katie Kirk, is standing by. Katie, anything new on your front? Well, actually, not yet, Brian. We should find out at 9 o'clock when uh, Dick Cheney and Colin Powell have a briefing here about what kind of uh, American losses were incurred as far as planes were concerned. Many military officials here say they would be very surprised if we didn't lose any planes in this kind of massive military strike. As Mike said, it was tremendous firepower. They were predicting that about 10 planes would be lost a day. Now, it might be that, uh, in fact, that's under that number, the, the actual loss of planes. But we should find out more in the upcoming hours. Now, we can report Pentagon officials ad nauseum. But let's hear from some of the U.S. pilots who were pretty pumped up after they completed their nighttime sorties. Watch the ground fire come up, and, and the first response was, gee, that's neat. And then the second response is, it's aimed at me. And then it became very realistic. You sit there, and you watch this stuff come up. And, and at some point, you become comfortable, almost, with what you're doing because you're in your cockpit. And then you realize that this isn't the time to become comfortable with what you're doing because you've got stuff being aimed at you. You can't get overconfident. It's almost like scoring an early touchdown or something. You get overconfident, and they can still beat you 38 to 6 or something. Uh, the mission isn't over until it's over. And until you come back down on the ground and you go through your debrief, the mission is still going on. So until you get your feet back firmly on the ground, that's, that's the point when you can go, OK, I'm done. Brian, while the mood here is very positive. Officials say they should caution the American public not to think that this is over. As you know, the air attack is continuing. They estimate that this is going to go on anywhere from three to ten days. And just because the air battle is complete doesn't mean that the ground forces won't be another major American challenge for the U.S. forces and for the Allied forces in Saudi Arabia. All right. Katie Kirk at the Pentagon. Let's go on over to the White House and see what's new that uh, Jim Miklaszewski has to tell us. Jim? Well, President Bush was up at about very early this morning. He was uh, in the West Wing uh, shortly after 5 o'clock, uh, monitoring the situation there, getting an update, went back to his residence, and now is back in the West Wing. We believe at this point he's in the Oval Office. He stuck his head in the briefing room ever so briefly this morning, uh, and to those uh, reporters who were in the room, said that uh, things were going pretty well. He appeared pretty upbeat and positive at this point. But as Katie mentioned, some officials here are, are still scratching their heads over why there was uh, no uh, sort of response really at all from the Iraqis after that initial attack. So while the uh, mood is positive, uh, there is still some caution. Uh, I, I'm particularly struck by the contrast of descriptions of these two leaders this morning. Uh, I told you just a moment ago that the president was uh, upbeat and positive. Uh, the stories we're seeing out of Baghdad this morning about appearances by Saddam Hussein call him grim and resolute. I think at this point that about says it all. All right, Mick, thanks very much. Let's go to Tel Aviv right now. And uh, correspondent Martin Fletcher is, is standing by. Martin, is, is it fair to, I think it's fair to say the Israelis were pleased at the performance of the U.S. armed forces. Were they surprised? Well, both pleased and surprised, Bryant, the politicians uh, and in particular, we're congratulating the United States. Each, they, they keep saying they're impressed by the performance of the pilots. And of course, they're thankful that their enemy, Iraq, has been reduced. It's not quite clear yet that the war is over. In fact, it certainly isn't. But the Israelis are, are, are happy at the, uh, the progress so far. But there's also surprise among the people. They've been preparing for, for days, almost a week, for what appear to be possibly gas war, certainly a conventional attack. And that attack hasn't happened, so the people are surprised, and there's a feeling of, of joy in the streets, or, the, or rather in the homes, because the people are still not allowed in the streets. There's a state of emergency here, Brian. Is it premature to say they're out of the war? 
They, well, I, I've, I've asked just about everybody I've spoken to whether Israel is now out of it, you know, and they all say the same thing. It's just too early to yeah. say. It certainly looks that way. It's all, it looks almost impossible that Iraq could send any kind of missile here. The, uh, the Israelis are skeptical that the, Isra that the Iraqi Air Force is completely out of it because many Iraqi planes would have been in reinforced concrete bunkers underground. And so the Israelis are sure some of those must have survived, but they, they don't fear the Iraqi Air Force. It, yes, it, yes, Brian, one can really pretty surely say the Israelis are right out of it now and want to, stay, want to keep it that way. All right, Martin Fletcher in Tel Aviv, thank you. Let's go on an open phone line to Baghdad where Tom Aspel uh, watched the bombing throughout the night. Tom, give us a damage report if you would. Uh, Brian, I'm, I'm having a lot of breakup here. The... Sorry, uh, Brian, can you say again? I'm getting a lot sure. of breakup here. Conditions not so sure, good. Tom, let me repeat myself, and I'll, I'll do it in deliberate fashion. Can you give us a damage report? Uh, Brian, so far around town, we do know that the defense ministry in the center of uh, Baghdad took some hits. Also, the headquarters of the Iraqi Ba'ath Party and one power station and a telecommunications building. Those targets have all been hit. Uh, we can confirm that. But we are also hearing that there is heavy damage at Baghdad International Airport. We're not so sure about that, although from time to time this morning, uh, even in daylight hours, we did hear heavy bombing coming from that direction way on the western edge of the city. But so far, the, uh, the residential areas downtown seem uh, untouched, just uh, selective targets, the, the Ba'ath Party headquarters, power station, telecommunications building, and the Ministry of Defense. Okay, Tom Aspel. So I guess if it is possible to do both, there was saturation bombing, but also surgical strikes as they concern the, uh, the residential areas. Tom, we'll try to get that phone line cleared up a little bit and get back to you later. Thank you. Uh, we're moving up on 712 on this Thursday morning. We'll come back in just a moment. Deborah will get some Senate reaction after a break. This is Today on NBC. Guys, the high about 76 degrees, overnights generally in the 60s. Enjoy yourself. Good morning. It was an international scandal. It was dark. She was very modest. He never even touched her with his hands. That's impossible. How could he not know? Young Butterfly, astounding audiences in New York. London, Paris, see Broadway's Tony Award winning best play, M. Butterfly. Coming to Fort Lauderdale and Miami, tickets at Ticketmaster. I still do it. I do it with anybody. I help others do it. I do it three times a week. I do it till I get it right. The women love the way I do it. You want to go home and do it? Again? Imperial Point at Sunrise Lakes is such a great place to live. The homeowners have a do-it club. What they do is recommend friends to own an apartment. And you can do it from the 60s. Imperial Point at Sunrise Lakes. 60-year-olds do it better. What in the world is going on? Let's face it, times are tough. Knowing what's happening when it happens is more important than ever. That's why Channel 4 News is making you this promise. From now on, Channel 4 News is your source for news every hour on the hour. With updates all day, all night, 24 hours a day. Watch, because in times like these, you want to know what in the world is going on. Channel 4 News, South Florida's 24-hour news source. Here are a few year-round water conservation tips from Channel 4. Avoid watering your lawn on windy, hot, sunny days, especially during the hours of 9 to 5. During dry spells, don't fertilize your plants. This increases their need for water. And remember to turn off your automatic sprinklers during or after rainfall. It's a matter of time. Police say he spiked spaghetti for sex. Pasta al forno. A current affair. Weekdays at 7 following NBC Nightly News, only on Channel 4. And there was plenty of debate in Washington beforehand over just whether the United States should be involved militarily in the Persian Gulf. With us from our Washington newsroom are Georgia Democratic Senator Sam Nunn. He's the head of the Senate Armed Services Committee. And Indiana Republican Senator Richard Lugar, member of the Foreign Relations Committee. Gentlemen, good morning. Good morning. Uh, Senator Nunn, I understand you have had opportunity to talk with Secretary of Defense Cheney. What has he told you thus far about American casualties? Well, I didn't get a casualty count, but the Iraqi reports of 14 aircraft down are greatly exaggerated. We had a very, very few uh, aircraft shot down. In fact, it was almost unbelievable 
I think it's due to the professionalism of our forces. We have excellent pilots, excellent equipment, a good plan, well led, and uh, I think we achieved in the initial stages at least our major strategic goals. The first goal was to make sure that we knocked out those Scud missiles which were threatening to the Israeli population. If uh, Israel had been hit, it could have uh, split the alliance and that was an enormously important goal. A second overall goal was to gain control of the air. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of facets of that, but I think we now have control of the air, so I think the initial stages, although we have a way to go, uh, were very, very successful and we took very, very few casualties, which is uh, certainly wonderful. When you say very few, can you quantify that for me? The secretary authorized me to say that we had one aircraft down. Uh, he'll have to clarify that later, at, uh, and that was initial reports. I think we have to be cautious, but uh, that was what he told me about 6.15 this morning, and he did say that uh, it could be uh, revealed. Okay, thank you for that. Um, let me also ask you about some of the other objectives, which the president repeated again last night, that being to eliminate the nuclear, the biological, and the chemical weapons capabilities of Saddam Hussein's army. Do you have any report on whether that's been accomplished? If not completely, then to what degree? Well, sir. Certainly that was a major strategic goal. We have a little more time to uh, take care of that one, and I think we, we have already hit a number of targets, and I'm sure we'll be hitting other targets. Uh, I do not have a, a, a damage assessment. I think that'll be coming later in the morning from the Secretary of Defense. Senator Luger, there was a great deal of discussion before uh, Operation Desert Shield was transformed to Desert Storm over whether the United States ought to be properly involved. How do you assess the President's handling of it thus far? You were notified prior to the, uh, the planes going in. Well, I think the president has handled the situation magnificently, but uh, likewise our military commanders and our military forces. It seems to me that uh, wars occur when people miscalculate the situation. Certainly the president, the United Nations, uh, the Soviet Union, everybody attempted to inform Saddam Hussein. Obviously he was not convinced. And I would say the competence with which our forces are carrying forward these activities is bound to be impressive not only to our friends but to our foes alike. We are, I think, forging a path toward peace in the future by the competence that we're displaying right now. Will that be a path toward peace that will exist because the United States is militarily strong or because many nations of the world have come together in a military fashion? Well, clearly it is great to have the United Nations effort and the credibility of the United Nations is at stake. Well, let me just say very candidly, what people are looking at in the world today is the competence of the United States of America. And our forces and the, the record that they are making presently is, in my judgment, the, the strongest reason that we'll have peace. Gentlemen, at some point in time, the bill for all of these uh, missiles and planes and uh, jet aircraft and everything else is going to come. And uh, you folks in Washington are going to have to decide how to pay for it. Are we going to see higher taxes? I don't think because of this. Uh, we have a huge deficit before this problem, and uh, that deficit problem continues. But we should get a lot of help from our allies. I hope the Japanese and the Germans will put a lot more into the uh, overall fund. Saudi Arabians have indicated about they'll pay about 50 percent. I'm sure the Kuwaitis will pay more. But right now, the priority ought to be on uh, doing everything we can to make sure our men and women are uh, fully supported, and I think we'll do that in every way. All right. Uh, Senator Sam Nunn of Georgia, mm -hmm. Senator Richard Luger of Indiana, thank you both for being with us. Thank you. And we'll be back in just a moment, 18 minutes after the hour. Back after this. People like you are determined to win. You don't settle for being second best. Neither do we. We're Century 21, and if you want to make the most of your future, talk to us during Career Opportunity Week. We're the largest real estate sales organization in the world. So if you want to be among the best at Century 21, it's as good as done. Ever feel too clumsy some mornings to make a pot of coffee? Wake up to Maxwell House filter packs. Coffee blended with Colombian beans. Pre-measured in their own filters. Because better beans do make better coffee. No fumbling, no bumbling. You get a perfect pot every time. Maxwell House filter packs blended with Colombian beans. Because better beans make better coffee. The fast food burger, quite tasty, but so much weighs against it. The fat, the cholesterol, the calories.
Introducing new light balance microwavable meals, mouth-watering dishes that are low in fat, low in cholesterol, averaging less than 195 calories, resulting in a perfect balance between good taste and good nutrition. New light balance meals from Lunch Bucket Brands. Now you can have your taste and eat right too. Hey, the baking soda experts at Arm and Hammer have done it again. Now they've invented new Arm and Hammer Dental Care Gel. A refreshing gel with a terrific cool mint taste. Mmm, you're gonna love it. And Arm & Hammer Dental Care Gel is the only gel with baking soda, which many dentists recommend. Now you can try the baking soda gel for free. Look for this coupon in this Sunday's paper and get a free trial size of Arm & Hammer Dental Care Gel. Dentists recommend baking soda. I recommend the taste. If indeed the adage is true that real soldiers talk logistics, no one's more qualified to do so than retired Army Colonel David Hackworth. He's America's most decorated living soldier, and he's now in Dharan, Saudi Arabia, reporting for Newsweek magazine. Colonel Hackworth, good seeing you again. Good morning. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. What do you make of last night? Well, what I make of it is I'm really proud of our aviators. Uh, they've done one hell of a job. Uh, this war, Brian, is going to be known as the six-minute war. And when those B-52s get done with uh, those defensive positions in Kuwait, it's going to be all over. So uh, I, I think that our forces have done a wonderful job, and we can really salute the boys that have flown those airplanes. The six-minute war, isn't that a little premature? Well, I think that the B-52s are just going to do a job in this battlefield of Kuwait. It's only 80 miles wide and 80 miles long, and they're going to make it look like one big waffle. Well, let me, let, me, let me not tell stories out of school, Colonel, but going into this, you were a little concerned about our level of readiness. Have you now changed your mind? I, I was concerned about the level of readiness of the ground troops. I was worried about the U.S. 7th Corps just getting off the boat and not doing the job. It uh, looks like air power is doing the job, Brian. This is a little sandbox, and it's the kind of fight that the USA does well. It's kind of World War II all over again, but with a really top uh, air effort. Do you still think it's going to take a ground war, though? Do you think we'll ever move to phase two? I don't think so. My examination now is that if we keep uh, putting the 52s in uh, as we've used them, uh, they're going to do it, uh, uh, the job that's necessary, and we won't have to use infantry to clean out those uh, Iraqi forces uh, in the defensive line. They're about a third-rate infantry force in there, and I think once uh, they realize what's happening to them, you're going to see uh, mass defections, not unlike the Russians in World War I. Let me bring in uh, Colonel Harry Summers in Washington, our military analyst who's been with us uh, these many weeks. Colonel, good morning. Good morning. You and I have talked history before. Um, experience says that almost any war plan starts coming apart the minute the first shot is fired. Could that still happen here? Well, it has happened. It happened with Saddam Hussein's war plan, obviously. He what about ours? So far, so good. Ours seems to be holding very well. In fact, uh, uh, going much better, I'm sure, than most people anticipated, so that uh, our war plan seems to be holding up, but his war plan has collapsed, so that uh, a, we, all, we always need to remember war is a two-edged game. You have also told me that history instructs. Historically, in air wars, casualties are high the first day and then fall off. They are low on the first day. What's that suggest about what's to come? I think it's the gross miscalculation on the part of Saddam Hussein that he really didn't believe we'd do it. We caught him on the ground, we, evidently, uh, with his air defenses not up, his planes not in the air. He's lost, it seems at least now in these early stages, he's lost air control. He's not going to be able to recover it. So that opens the way for all sorts of things, uh, both ground attack and a continuation of the kind of uh, B-52 bombing that Colonel Hackworth was talking about that can be enormously destructive against uh, fortified positions, and he doesn't have the, the aircraft to challenge them with, uh, even to the extent that North Vietnam, Vietnam uh, was able on a limited basis to challenge the B-52s over Hanoi. You make it sound like you ought to just give up. Well, I think he's, his options are very rapidly running out, and of course that's the objective of military operations, is to take away the enemy's uh, options, mm -hmm. and he has very few options left. Colonel David Hackworth, final note. Um, is it realistic to expect him to surrender at any early stage? 
Yeah, I think what he's uh, looked at us as, uh, as a lightweight like Iran was, uh, a force that didn't have a lot of air, uh, it was a light <laughs> infantry force, and suddenly yeah. it's kind of like a midget volleyball team, Brian, uh, playing the 49ers. Colonel Hackworth, Colonel Summers, gentlemen, thank you. Some of the stations, station break. Four hour news source. This is a Channel 4 News update. America at war. America is at war, and South Florida is watching closely as events continue to unfold. Good morning, everyone. I'm Steve Abrams. War is no longer a threat. It is a fact affecting all of us in South Florida and across the country. Members of Congress are reacting quickly to Operation Desert Storm. From Capitol Hill, Florida, Senator Connie Mack says he feels for the families of soldiers stationed in the Middle East. And right here in South Florida, Representative Larry Smith fully backs the president. Even though I thought I was prepared for it, the emotion of realizing we were going to war was almost overwhelming. Uh, after that, I clearly understood that, you know, war had begun, and my thoughts turned to the parents and husbands and wives uh, around the country who have loved ones in uh, Saudi Arabia, hoping that we had put the right plan together to minimize uh, casualties. I hope and pray that we've done the right thing. It's hard to know what he's thinking at any time, but I would imagine if he's being honest, at least with himself, if not with his people, he's thinking that he took a calculated risk and he lost and lost big. He will have lost his whole capacity for offensive military capability in Iraq. He will have lost his air force, his command and control, a lot of his forces, the Republican Guard, etc., in Kuwait. And I think that he's thinking now he may have made a very serious mistake, and he's hoping that he can just survive, his physical uh, well-being can survive, so that he can still claim that he is stood up against us and that he's a hero to the Arab man in the street. And, and as you saw there, those comments were recorded earlier. Prayers for peace are now pleas for safety for the soldiers sent into war. Across South Florida, churches remained open into the night and all morning long. It's in response to the high demand for a place where people can go to meditate. Many churches have not planned special services until the faithful began gathering on their own. Many South Floridians found themselves glued to their television sets last night watching America go to war. Channel 4's David Bloom talked with folks about their reactions and their feelings. From Miami Lakes, let's get it over with quickly, to Miami Beach. Well, I hope it's um, fierce and quick. I hope not too many people die. Across South Florida, the message is the same. I hate to see the country at war, but uh, if we have to do it, you know, it's good that we get it over with now. And no choice but to drive Saturn from Kuwait by force. As the president spoke, the normally raucous crowd at this Miami Lake sports bar was quiet. I'm glad that they started already. Let's get it over with. As a defense expert, I would ask you, does that not lead to the... At Bayside in Miami, taxi cab drivers listened to the news on radio, wondering what would be Saddam's next move. I don't know what he's going to do after this, you know, with the weapons that he has. At this VFW post on Miami Beach, a handful of men gathered, all too familiar with the dangers that lie ahead. Some raised a glass, but there were no toasts to war. I'm a Vietnam vet. I'd hate to see them people go through that. It should be fast. But I, I never expected uh, a war. No kidding. I thought maybe uh, this guy would uh, give in and, you know, that'd be it. I'm really surprised. Is it tough watching this? Is that viable? Yeah, I mean, I'll tell you the truth. You're shaking me up. David Bloom, Channel 4 News, Miami. The war is already having a significant effect on the business community, especially for the travel industry. People have been canceling overseas flights for months now. And the threat of terrorism is keeping many from flying even domestically. But travel agents say U.S. travel is perfectly safe. Security is pretty tight in our, in our country, and I feel pretty comfortable that everybody's safe. However, if they have any doubts, we're able to work with non-refundable tickets and penalty tickets and get the rules re have been very relaxed on, on this sort of thing. And that is the latest from South Florida this morning. Our next local report is about 60 minutes from now here on Channel 4 News, your 24-hour news source. This 
This has been a Channel 4 News update. America at War. Stay tuned as 24-hour continuous news coverage continues. Back 7:30 on a um, Thursday morning, a Thursday on which we are focusing our attention, rightfully, on Desert Storm, an operation that began at uh, seven o'clock last night, and by all accounts, has went, gone very well. Has has gone um, scarily well. I yeah. mean, frighteningly well. It it uh, you want to keep reining yourself in and say let's let's not get ahead of ourselves, and yet all indications are that very few things have gone wrong. So far. One of the things that we're all struggling with this morning is the fact that we don't have any hard information about just how many casualties uh, Allied forces have suffered. Um, just a few minutes ago, Sam Nunn told us that uh, Secretary of Defense Dick Cheney has told him that the United States has lost at least one jet. We assume it is an F-15 that uh, reportedly crash-landed in the Gulf. The two pilots who were part of that were rescued safely. There may be other casualties, but that is all he is authorized to uh, confirm. There have been some other losses of aircraft, but we assume assume that, uh, um, that there were no deaths Well, let us, let us, let us confirm uh, one loss. Uh, Douglas Heard, Defense Minister in Great Britain, has confirmed that the, um, the British did lose one tornado in, uh, in last night's operation. There were 45 to 50 involved in that operation, but uh, he has confirmed the loss of one. We don't know about the crew. Let's go on down to uh, our White House correspondent, Jim Miklaszewski, who has some news for us from, uh, from the White House out front there. Jim, what's up? Well, we talked a few minutes ago with uh, some U.S. officials who uh, would not confirm what uh, Sam Nunn had to say, but it appears now that there has been at least one U.S. aircraft lost. And uh, from what we understand, uh, that may not be officially confirmed until Secretary of Defense Cheney briefs.